to, we've adapted as people have adapted, and so therefore we are in the midst of another transition. And so when we talk about some of the things about these game-changing ideas that we have to think about doing it differently, and we have to be able to connect the ministry with the dollar, and some of those things might be frustrating to you. Why, why should I have to explain this? You should just do it. Why, why do we have to preach about it? I mean, that's, that's usually some of the initial reactions that I get from church leaders. They're frustrated because they're projecting their point of view onto the people of the pew, and there's a vast difference between the view from the pew and the view from the pulpit on this subject. But we are in the midst of a transition, and if we don't adapt, we risk being subject to some of the things that we looked about yesterday, where, where one particular author projected that in the next 30 years, churches will lose 70% of all its funding. The word stewardship, when you type it into Google, has more, uh, roughly 8 million hits. How about that? Now, not all of that is about church stewardship, but it's still a word that people are using today. And I would contend it's still a very important word, especially when we bring the conversation of church funding into the area of spiritual formation. 20%, 20%, one in five American Christians give absolutely nothing to the church. <laughs> Passing the Plate is a great book, uh, I believe it's Oxford. University Press that, that, uh, that put this out, but they, they did a whole study about American Christians' orientation toward giving. And, and there's, there's two emerging myths that they, they discovered. You have the Horatio Alger myth that has made America what it is, right? Pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. You are the success, the sum total of the success that you create for yourself. It's a very healthy thing. That's what's made us great as a country. And then you have this other myth that we hear about within, with, within, the, within our spiritual, spiritual places of worship where we hear that God says, no, everything you have is mine, and, and, and you need to give a portion of that back. Do you see how those two myths come from two completely point of views and create a dissonance that people have not been able to resolve? If everything is mine and the success is determined by my own effort, how can then I assimilate the fact that I have to somehow am now obligated to give back to someone who wasn't part of that success, right? Those are two competing myths that we have to reconcile for people. And so in the midst of that, they coined a phrase that I really love, that the typical American Christian's posture toward giving is a discretionary obligation. In English, we call that an oxymoron. But you have... You, you, have, you have these two competing ideas where people understand and they hear what the pastor is saying. They read what the Bible has to say, but then they're also processing through the fact that what I have is mine. So I'm going to give you what I think is worthy of you. And I think in the midst of that, we somehow have lost our understanding of the role of stewardship. And I think this is where the conspiracy, if you will, is so important for us to bring back to the conversation. We talked about yesterday that two and a half percent is the average, what the average American gives toward charitable causes. The average amount of disposable income. So if you gross that up, like we talked about yesterday, about two percent. And you might think that that's a relatively new number. Actually, that's been true since 1967 arguably the height of denominationalism, right? The time when, as I've heard so many times, when everyone tithed. If you think that's true, then I, I might suggest that you reconsider. Because that simply isn't the case. And as we looked at yesterday, just statistically, if you look at that, if people are only giving two to two and a half percent of, 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 of what they have to give, disposable or gross, however you want to look at it, to charity, that means if 10% is our baseline, if that is our understanding of the tithe, depending on your orientation to that, I understand lots of varying degrees of that, but let's just use that as a common rule of thumb, then our churches are roughly getting 20 to 25% of the potential dollars available presently today. Wouldn't you like to go back and see your church budget quadruple? 
But that's the gap that we're missing. That's the opportunity that we're looking for. And if we don't engage this conversation, not only are we going to continue to manage to find, we are going to miss out on the ministry that God intended for us to accomplish in the churches and communities and where we, where we exist. So, let's look at the word stewardship. So, and I, I think arguably there is a lot of conversation around whether or not we like it or not, and we can't really decide in church if we like it or we don't like it. And a lot of it has to do with, have we, do we have a holistic understanding of stewardship, or have we only heard stewardship when it's time to do the pledge drive? Um, and so that's our association with it. It's kind of like if the only time you've ever been to the dentist is when they pulled all your teeth, you never want to talk about dentistry, right? <laughs> So, so there was a period of time where we loved the word stewardship. It was a deep word. It had a lot of meaning. And then all of a sudden, we decided that we didn't like stewardship. So we're just going to throw it out. And what did we choose instead? We chose the word generosity. I bet you've heard a lot more about that. The problem is, is that we don't have any unique take on the word generosity because you don't even have to be a person of faith to be generous. And so if we're talking about a a conspiracy to bring our lives in alignment with God's intentions, then we have to have some spiritual dimension to it. So then we decided we didn't like generosity. <laughs> and we went back to the word stewardship. I might suggest that we not throw out the word simply because we feel like it might be uncomfortable or that we are uncomfortable with the word. But I might suggest that we take a deeper look at what that word really means and the weight that it might play in our lives. Because I think stewardship in particular hits the mark. It is the center of what it means to be a follower of Christ. Doesn't mean that everything is about money. But seeing our lives as something to be cared for, for the purpose of being available to be used by God, is in fact what the whole spiritual journey is about. And a word that I like to use in addition to stewardship or to describe stewardship is the idea of alignment. And we've already talked about that a little bit. But, it, but it's, if, if our lives are scattered and we have multiple priorities, it's hard to know what to do next. And so if, if we don't talk about stewardship, or, or we, when we do talk about stewardship, it's not in a healthy sense, or if, if we're confused about what our priorities should be and what's important as a church, as a person, as a being, then our lives are going to be out of alignment, and it's not going to feel like things are all working together. We've all been a part of causes. We've all been a part of churches. We've all been a part of teams. We've all been had those experiences in our life where we feel like everything is working together for good things, right? We've all been had those moments where it seemed like no matter what we did, everything was just cumulative, and it just built on the other. When you look back, those were also the times that we had the greatest amount of clarity about the meaning and significance of the things that were in our lives. We had the greatest amount of clarity around the opportunity that was before us. We had the greatest amount of clarity that, of an opportunity that was before us that would not always be there. So when I talk about the word stewardship, particularly in light of spiritual formation, I look at it as aligning our lives with the intentions of God. And when we talk about stewardship, there's the five T's. Right? We always talk about time, talent, and treasure, but we left a couple off. And so this, just to give you a sense of, you know, at one time there were five T's, and it gave us a good understanding of the fact that stewardship was a very holistic thing. It was a stewardship of our time. Are we talking to our people that we're leading about what they're doing with their time? What we do with our time is how we spend our lives. And that's a limited asset. You can make more money, you can do bigger things, but you can't make more time. It also talks about our talents and our giftedness. And we talked about yesterday, I can't remember if it was, I think, I think it was offline, um, uh, kind of a side conversation, but I was talking about a particular pastor who was working with a couple of ex uh, Fortune 500 CFOs. And they were looking, you know, they're very engaged individuals. They really wanted to find a place to serve. Um, but they weren't going to serve in any of the traditional you know, things that we might think about. Teach a class, lead a Bible study, um, you know, speak from the platform. That just wasn't part of their DNA. And so he finally came up with the fact he was trying to fill a position of a business administrator in this particular church. 
And so he went to these two guys and he said, okay, I tell you what, I need 20 hours from each of you so I can get this full-time position. Would you guys volunteer your time to help lead this church and its finances, knowing what you've been doing, what you did for a lifetime for these companies? And they gladly did it. Talk about a stewardship of talent. To be able to find how God has uniquely gifted an individual and look for a way for them to benefit your church and the life of your community. Then, of course, there is our treasure. We do have to talk about money, as we talked about yesterday. I mean, money is part of the human experience, and there isn't any part of the divine experience that isn't also part of the human experience. And if we leave that out, then we risk the only people informing those people are the people we are responsible for and our people of faith with what culture has to say. And I'm not interested necessarily in saying someone's wrong and someone's right. It's not a zero-sum game. But I want to make sure that people have multiple perspectives so that they can arrive at the conclusion that's important for them. And if we don't talk about it, then we never have the chance to do that. And then our temple, taking care of our bodies. It's part of stewardship. It's part of making sure that what, what we have, the time that we have, can be accelerated or decelerated based upon our willingness to take care of our bodies. Our clarity of mind helps us um, make better decisions. Our preparedness and our, our the intellectual vigor that we go through through school and even beyond school. I mean, the statistics are crazy about how, you know, I think like 60 or 70 percent of college graduates never read another book after they graduate. Yeah. So they, the ability to uh, the, uh, the ability to take care of our minds and make us prepared, it's all part of stewardship. See where we're driving at? We, we have relegated, we, we, we've stripped stewardship of its depth, and we've relegated it to a conversation and an obligation that we have to have because we want to pay the light bill. And yet it's an opportunity for us to help people align their life with God's intention. And it really comes back to our understanding of the Lordship of Christ. Right? We're just talking about those two competing realities. We live in a world where people believe that their success is their own. Therefore, everything that comes as a result of it is theirs to possess and disperse at their discretion. To everything that I have is God's, and there are assets to be invested in the kingdom. Do you see the discrepancy between those two worldviews? If we're not addressing that, we can't reconcile that. That's a dissonance that becomes so confusing and so overwhelming that you're just naturally going to fall one way or the other. And we can't risk that. We talked yesterday about billionaires being the least likely to give to the church and answered the question, why is that the number one reason? Because they're not convinced the church would know what to do with the gift the size they could give. What an unfortunate reality because we have not brought stewardship into the spiritually formative conversation. And when we do that, the goal of a spiritual or a stewardship program should be to move people from one end of the spectrum to the other. It may take a lifetime, and that's okay. What's the rush? But if we're not adequately providing people the steps to, to take that next step and to be challenged in the next way, there are people in your church that need to have a healthy understanding of money. They didn't see it at home growing up. They haven't had it in their lives, and they may need some financial counseling in order to be able to, to reorient their lives. There are people that have discretionary income and have no consistent habits of giving to your church. They need to be challenged to give and why that's important and how together they can be part of change in your community and around the world. There are people who have been giving consistently and they've been giving the same for decades. They've never been challenged to go beyond that. I've never met anyone who's gone beyond their present reality without someone interjecting a challenge to take them where they need to go next. I mean, that's why we have coaches, right? So you've seen the wrestling team out here. These coaches know more about what those kids can do than they do right now. And they will do things that they never thought was possible because the coach challenged them to go somewhere that they didn't think was practical. You are the coaches for the people in your church. And there are some people that need to be challenged to live in a generous way. We talked yesterday about a surgeon and his wife who decided at one point in their life that to, to live off 10% or 15% of their income for the remainder of their life. Think about what that frees up in dollars and time and, and, and the, the legacy that leaves behind 
That's an understanding. They did that. They did that because they were challenged, of course, but they did that because they had an understanding, a complete understanding of the Lordship of Christ. The fact that everything that we have, our time, our talent, our treasure, our temple, our testimony, our assets to be invested in the kingdom. The reason why we don't like to deal with stewardship is because it's measurable. But you can't manage what you don't measure. That's right. I, I always tell people that, that uh, you know, that I can tell the spiritual vitality of a church based upon the giving habits. Are they growing or is it declining? Is there, are, are, there, are there consistently more and more people giving? Consistently more and more. That shows it's an outward sign. It's not the only sign, but it's an outward sign that we can look at and point to as, 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 a, as an indicator of health. You know, we measure everything in life. We measure grades. We measure scores in sports. We measure, uh, we do performance reviews in business. We measure our retirement plans. We measure our insurance. But somehow when we come to church, arguably the most important thing that we do, given the fact that it has eternal implications, we resist measuring anything. You can't grow until you know where you are and create that baseline to be able to work against that. Stewardship is also uncomfortable, especially when you talk about a spiritually formative process because it holds us accountable, right? You can't, you can't argue out the idea that you either gave or you didn't give. It is what it is, and we have to talk about it. It holds us accountable to being true to who God calls us to be. Again, money is an outward sign. It's a practical reality, but, but it goes through a holistic process. Are we in alignment with where God wants us to be right now? And is every person in your congregation in alignment with where God wants them to be about money and other issues? The other thing I really like about stewardship is the fact that it's systematic. It's process-driven. And process helps people take the next step. And if you continue, continue to help people take the next step, they will grow. And spiritual formation is all about growth, right? Stewardship is also about freedom. Freedom to do some things that I think are very, very important. Freedom from control. Do you know why God wants us to, to, to practice the Lordship of Christ? Do you know why God wants us to give back 10%? Is to remind ourselves that we are not the determiners of our own destiny. That there's a larger purpose. That we are playing a role in a much larger production than we can ever imagine. And that keeps us true. That keeps us coming back to the fact that every time we have to surrender part of what we've been given, our time, our talent, our treasure, our temple, and our testimony, and preserve that as sacred. It gives us freedom to invest, not just financially, but our time. It gives us, it gives us freedom to invest in people, in projects, in our community. You know, it, it, it's heartbreaking sometimes to work with some churches and, and you, you look at their giving and you start asking some questions and you realize that if that church ceased to exist, the community wouldn't even know it was there in the first place. That's not good stewardship. Many of you serve churches, as we talked about yesterday, that, that are, are very old. They have a long history. Somebody had to foresee that a church needed to be there at some point because a church wasn't there. And for a hundred years or more, and some of the churches you're, you're serving or attending or participating in, you've been a vital part of that community. But are you today? Are you free to invest in the things that you need to invest in? And I love this freedom with significance. At the end of the day, we want our lives to count. We want our lives to matter. And I think when we invite stewardship into the conversation of our spiritual experience, we open ourselves up to truly seeing it as a way to do something that has eternal implications.